But when oil was discovered at Glenpool, it was the leaders in the nearby city of Tulsa who truly seized the moment. Tulsa already had hotels and a railroad, so Glenpool never grew beyond the size of an oil field town. This allowed Tulsa to become the oil capital of the world. Yes, of the world! Tulsa leaders quickly recognized the importance of the industry and went to great lengths to attract oilmen and their companies. Including the construction of a refinery complex just off the Arkansas River that became the largest independent refinery in the world. Largest. Number one. Investors established banks catering to the oil industry, while other businessmen built fine hotels, such as the Robinson, the Hotel Tulsa, and the Mayo, which is delicious. Tulsa became the headquarters for oilmen such as Henry F. Sinclair, William G. Skelly, James P. Chapman, Robert M. McFarlane, Wade Phillips, David R. and S. Miller Williams. That is a lot of initials. Among the wildcatters attracted to Oklahoma, one drilled for over eight years with no success. His name was Thomas B. Slick. But I be slicker. You be drooling. Slick's failures garnered him nicknames like Dry Hole Slick and Mad Tom Slick. What nicknames have your failures garnered you? Oh, lots. Uh, head lice Leo, throws like Brittany, and does not move like Jagger. In 1912, Slick drilled one last ditch effort on Frank Wheeler's farm in Drumright. The well came in on March 1st, leading to the discovery of the magnificent Cushing Field. What made Cushing Field so magnificent? It spread out in all directions from Slick's initial strike at Drumright, which inspired the names for subsequent boom towns in the area. Drop right, gas right, all right, down right, and just right. Is that right? Cushing Field also played a major role in fueling the Allied war effort in World War I. The quality of the crude found in Cushing was the highest that had been discovered west of the Mississippi. Cushing was suddenly producing 17% of all oil marketed in Oklahoma and 3% of the world's production. Yowza! Crudest town ever. This convinced investors to build refineries and massive storage facilities in and near Cushing, which is now known as the pipeline crossroads of the world. Another big Oklahoma oil success came in 1922, when wildcatter R.H. Smith's Betsy Foster No. 1 blew in. Betsy was a 2,800 barrel a day gusher, just southeast of Wewoka. We woke a bear on our last camping trip. By 1929, the Greater Seminole Field was the nation's premier producer of high-gravity oil, attracting independent oilmen and large companies like Shell Oil. And who could forget E.W. Marland, who found repeated success in multiple sites, becoming an oil legend in the process. Marlin, who was college educated, hired young geologists a decision that proved effective when he struck a gusher on what came to be known as Burbank Field. Soon, every major company had a staff of geologists. And a pet monkey. <laughs> no monkey. Marlin became a legendary figure in the oil industry, making and losing several fortunes. So, I'm smarter than Marlin because <laughs> I haven't even lost one fortune. He built two mansions in Ponga City and became one of the most generous philanthropists in state history. Marlin's oil interests were eventually absorbed into Continental Oil Company, or later known as Conoco. Oh. oh, posh. I have got to get me one of these, Piper. Um, okay. Oh, yes. The Great Depression came and dramatically reduced demand for oil and natural gas, while greatly increasing demand for ice cream and watching TV in your pajamas. Not that kind of depression. This began an era of change in the industry, seismology, a shift to smaller fields, new oilmen and companies, and the emergence of oil barons. Barons? The men behind Oklahoma oil. Ah, and perhaps the most beloved of all Oklahoma oilmen is the one and only Frank Phillips, who established the International Phillips Petroleum Company, which merged with Conoco in 2003. This is his lodge, where he hosted the most prominent men and women of his era.
In 1903, Phillips heard about the new oil field and moved to Bartlesville, where he spent his savings launching the Citizens Bank and Trust Company. He soon began to acquire oil leases, his interest growing until 1917 when he and his brother, L.E. Phillips, incorporated Phillips Petroleum Company. Phillips contributed significantly to the Boy Scouts of America. That's nice. How many boys did he contribute? Money. He contributed money. Oh. Guess what else Frank Phillips gave Oklahoma? Hmm. Hint, you're standing on it. Ah, that's right. Woolrock. Bingo. Sounds like a music festival attended by cavemen. <laughs> wow, this lodge is amazing. Woolrock's the best. Thanks, Frank Phillips. In 1939, Phillips was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. But a discussion about oilmen and their influence on Oklahoma would not be complete without one more noble addition. Lloyd Noble, to be exact. Lloyd Noble's life has made a long-term difference to Oklahoma, where he's recognized as one of the 50 most influential Oklahomans of the 20th century. He founded the Noble Drilling Company in 1921. As his success in the oil business grew, he became more involved in Oklahoma's political and cultural activities. He was president of the University of Oklahoma Board of Regents twice and was very active in petroleum business-related organizations. Sup, goat? But his greatest love lay with stewardship of the land. Determined that the 1930s Dust Bowl should never happen again, he formed the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation in 1945. The foundation was created to help farmers and ranchers preserve and restore their land. Through the Noble Foundation, Noble Drilling, and Noble Energy, the legacy of Lloyd Noble remains today throughout Oklahoma and the world. Ah. Honestly, Leo, I'm overheating with all this information. So I feel. Well, Piper, we'll learn more about the oil and natural gas industry on our next virtual field trip. I could use an oil change myself. Well, until next time, I'm Leo. And I'm Piper. Over and out.